Civilization, Volume 5, The Renaissance, Part 1, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 10, Side 2. Carlo Crivelli may also have been a pupil of the Viverini. However, he had to abscond from Venice soon after his seventeenth year, this in 1457. Having abducted the wife of a sailor, he was fined and jailed. Released, he sought safety in Padua, where he studied in Squarcione's school. In 1468 he moved to Ascoli, and spent his remaining twenty-five years painting pictures for the churches there and thereabouts. Perhaps because he left Venice so soon, Crivelli hardly shared in the progressive movement of Venetian painting. He preferred tempera to oil, kept to the traditional religious subjects, and adopted an almost Byzantine scheme of subordinating representation to decoration. He gave his pictures an enamel finish, which went well with the gilded frames of the polyptics he filled. And though his Madonnas seem cold, there is a delicate grace in their drawing that presages Giorgione. Vettor, or Vittore Carpaccio, was a major among these miners. Starting with studies in perspective and design in the matter of Montaigne, he adopted the narrative style of Gentile Bellini, added to it a youthful preference for imaginary idols rather than contemporary events, and applied to his romantic themes a fully developed technique. Quite alien to his usually blithe spirit is an early picture, in New York, Meditation on the Passion, a macabre study of Saints Jerome and Onofrius, imagining Christ seated before them dead, with skull and crossbones at their feet, and a background of lowering clouds. When he was thirty-three in 1488, Carpaccio received an important commission to paint for the school of Saint Ursula a series of pictures illustrating her history. In nine picturesque panels he told how the handsome Prince Conan of England had come to Brittany to wed Ursula, daughter of its king how she begged him to postpone the wedding until, with a train of eleven thousand virgins, she could make a pilgrimage to Rome, how Conan accompanied her lovingly, and all received the papal blessing, how then an angel appeared to Ursula and announced that she and her virgins must go to Cologne and be martyred, how she leaves the sorrowing Conan and, with her train, goes in calm dignity to Cologne, how its pagan kinglet proposes marriage to her, and when she refuses, slays all eleven thousand and one. The legend suited Carpaccio's fancy. He delighted in picturing the crowds of maidens and courtiers, and made nearly every one of them aristocratic and fair and colorfully dressed. And to the various scenes he brought not only his pictorial science, but his knowledge of actual things, the forms of architecture, the shipping in a bay, the patient procession of the clouds. In an interval of his nine years' labor with Ursula, Carpaccio painted for the school of St. John the Evangelist the healing of the demoniac by a relic of the Holy Cross. Daring comparison with Gentile Bellini, Vittore described a scene on a Venetian canal crowded with people, gondolas, and palaces. Here was all of Gentile's realism and detail, done with a brilliant finish beyond the older man's reach. Stirred by Carpaccio's success, the school of St. George of the Slavonians asked him to commemorate their patron saint on the walls of their Venetian oratory. Again he took nine years and painted nine scenes. They do not quite equal the Ursula series, but Carpaccio, now in his fifties, had not lost his flair for representing graceful figures in harmonious combinations, and architectural backgrounds fanciful in conception but convincing in presentation. St. George attacks the dragon in an impetuous charge. In contrast, St. Jerome is shown as the quiet scholar immersed in study in a surprisingly handsome room, with no other company than his lion. Every feature in the room is pictured with minute fidelity, even to the musical score so legible on a fallen scroll that Molmenti transcribed it for the piano. In 1508 Carpaccio and two obscure artists were appointed to set a value on a strange mural painted by a rising young artist on an outer wall of the Fondaco dei Tedeschi, the warehouse of the Teuton merchants near the Rialto Bridge. He judged it worth a fee of 150 ducats, or about $1,875. Though Carpaccio still had eighteen years of life in him, he painted only one more great picture, a presentation in the temple of 1510 for the chapel of the Sanudo family in the church of San Giobbe. There it had to compete with John Bellini's Madonna of St. Job, and though the Virgin and her attendant ladies are lovely, 
Giovanni Natvitore is the victor in this silent contest. Carpaccio, in a later century, might have been the master of the age. It was his misfortune that he came between Giovanni Bellini and Giorgione. 4. Giorgione It might seem strange that artists should be hired at high fees to paint a warehouse wall. But in 1507 the Venetians felt that life without color was dead, and the German traders there, some from the great Jurors Nuremberg, had their own lusty sense of art. So they sublimated part of their profits into two murals, and had the luck to choose immortals for the task. The paintings soon succumbed to salt moisture and the sun, and only vague blotches remain, but even these attest the early fame of Giorgione da Castelfranco. He was then twenty-nine years old. We do not know his name. An old story made him the love child of an aristocratic Barbarelli and a woman of the people, but this may be an afterthought. In his thirteenth or fourteenth year, circa 1490, he was sent from Castelfranco to Venice to serve as apprentice to John Bellini. He developed rapidly, won substantial commissions, bought a house, painted a fresco on its front, and filled his home with music and revelry, for he played the lute well and preferred gay women in the flesh to the loveliest of them on canvas. What influences formed his wistful style, it is hard to say, for he was unlike the other painters of his day, except that he may have learned from Carpaccio some grace and charm. Probably the decisive influence came from letters rather than from art. When Giorgione was twenty-seven or twenty-eight, Italian literature was taking a bucolic turn. Sanazzaro published his Arcadia in 1504. Perhaps Giorgione read these poems and found in their pleasant fancies some suggestions of idealized landscapes and amours. From Leonardo, passing through Venice in 1500, Giorgione may have acquired a taste for a mystic, dreamy softness of expression, a delicacy of nuance, a refinement of manner that made him, for a tragically brief moment, the summit of Venetian art. Among the earliest works attributed to him, for in hardly any case can we be sure of his authorship, are two wood panels describing the exposure and rescue of the infant Paris. The story is an excuse for painting shepherds and rural landscapes breathing peace. In the first picture that is by common consent his, The Gypsy and the Soldier, we get a typically Georgianesque fancy. A casual woman, naked except for a shawl round her shoulders, sits on her discarded dress on the mossy bank of a rushing stream, nurses a child, and looks anxiously about her. Behind her stretches a landscape of Roman arches, a river and a bridge, towers and a temple, curious trees, white lightning, and green storm-laden clouds. Near her is a comely youth holding a shepherd's staff, but richly garbed for a shepherd, and so pleased with the scene that he ignores the gathering storm. The story is uncertain. What the picture means is that Giorgione liked handsome youths, soft-contoured women, and nature even in its moods of wrath. In 1504 he painted for a bereaved family in the town of his birth, the Madonna of Castelfranco. It is absurd and beautiful. In the forefront, St. Liberale, in the shining armor of a medieval knight, holds a lance for the Virgin, and St. Francis preaches to the air. High aloft on a double pedestal, Mary sits with her babe, who leans recklessly out from his high perch. But the green and violet brocade at Mary's feet is a wonder of color and design. Mary's robes fall about her in wrinkles as lovely as wrinkles can ever be. Her face has the gentle tenderness that poets picture in the mates of their dreams, and the landscape recedes with Leonardesque mystery till the sky melts into the sea. When Giorgione and his friend Tiziano Vecelli received the assignment to paint the Fondaco dei Tedeschi, Giorgione chose the wall fronting the Grand Canal, and Titian took the Rialto side. Vasari, examining Giorgione's fresco half a century later, found it impossible to make head or tail of what another spectator described as Trophies, nude bodies, heads in chiaroscuro, geometricians measuring the terrestrial globe, perspectives of columns, and between them men on horseback and other fantasies. However, the same writer adds, it may be seen how accomplished Giorgione was in handling colors in fresco. But his genius lay in conception rather than coloring. When he painted the sleeping Venus that was a priceless treasure of the Dresden Gallery, he might have thought of her in purely sensual terms as an inviting formation of molecules. Doubtless she is that too, and marks the passage of Venetian art from Christian to pagan themes and sentiment. But there is nothing immodest or suggestive about this Venus. She lies asleep, precariously nude in the open air, 
on a red cushion and a white silken robe, her right arm under her head, her left hand serving as a fig leaf, one perfect limb outstretched over another raised beneath it. Seldom has art so simulated the velvet texture of feminine surfaces or so conveyed the grace of a natural pose. But on her face is a look of such innocence and peace as rarely accord with naked beauty. Giorgione here has put himself beyond good and evil and lets the aesthetic sense transiently dominate desire. In another piece, the Fête Champêtre, or Pastoral Symphony of the Louvre, the pleasure is frankly sexual, and yet again has all the innocence of nature. Two nude women and two clothed men are enjoying a holiday in the countryside, a patrician youth in a doublet of gleaming red silk strumming a lute, beside him a disheveled shepherd painfully trying to bridge the gap between a simple and a cultivated mind, the aristocrat's lady in a graceful motion emptying a crystal pitcher into a well, the shepherd's lass waiting patiently for him to attend to her charms or her flute. No notion of sin has entered their heads. The lute and the flute have sublimated sex into harmony. Behind the figures rises one of the richest landscapes in Italian art. Finally, in the concert of the Pitti Palace, desire seems forgotten as irrelevantly primitive, and music is all, or becomes a bond of friendship subtler than desire. Until the nineteenth century, this most Georgianesque of all pictures was regularly accredited to Giorgione. Many critics now ascribe it to Titian. Since the matter is still doubtful, let us leave the authorship to Giorgione, because he loved music only next to women, and because Titian is rich enough in masterpieces to spare one to his friend. At the left a plumed youth stands, a bit lifeless and negative. A monk sits at a clavichord, his beautifully rendered hands on the keys, his face turned round to a bald cleric on our right. The cleric lays one hand on the monk's shoulder and holds in the other a cello resting on the floor. Has the music ended, or not yet begun? It does not matter. What moves us is the silent depth of feeling in the countenance of the monk, whose every fiber has been refined, and his every sentiment ennobled by music. He hears it long after all the instruments have been mute. That face, not idealized but profoundly realized, is one of the miracles of Renaissance painting. Giorgione lived a short life and apparently a merry one. He seems to have had many women and to have healed each broken romance with a new one soon begun. Vasari reports that Giorgione caught the plague from his latest love. All that we know is that he died in the epidemic of 1511 at the age of 34. His influence was already extensive. A dozen Georgianesque minor artists painted rural idols, conversation pieces, musical interludes, mask costumes, in vain efforts to capture the refinement and finish of his style, the airy overtones of his landscapes, the guileless eroticism of his themes. He left two pupils who were to make a stir in the world, Sebastiano del Piombo, who went off to Rome, and Tiziano Vicelli, the greatest Venetian of all. 5. Titian, The Formative Years, 1477 to 1533. He was born in the town of Pieve, in the Cadoric range of the Dolomites, whose rugged mountains were well remembered in his landscapes. When he was nine or ten, he was brought to Venice and was apprenticed successively to Sebastiano Zucato, Gentile Bellini, and Giovanni Bellini. In Giovanni's studio, he worked side by side with Giorgione, who was his senior by only a year. When that Keats of the Brush set up his own studio, Titian probably went with him as assistant or associate. He was so deeply influenced by Giorgione that some of his early pictures have been ascribed to Giorgione, and some of Giorgione's later pictures to Titian. The inimitable concert probably belongs to this period. Together they painted the Fondaco walls. From the plague that took Giorgione's life, or from the moratorium laid upon Venetian art by the War of the League of Cambrai, Titian fled to Padua in 1511. There he painted three frescoes for the Scuola del Santo, recording miracles of St. Anthony. If we may judge from their crudity, Titian at thirty-five had far to go before equaling the best work of Giorgione. Goethe, however, with penetrating hindsight, saw in them the promise of great things. Returning to Venice, Titian addressed to the Doge and the Council of Ten, on May 31, 1513, a letter that recalls Leonardo's appeal to Lodovico a generation before. Illustrious Prince, High and Mighty Lords, I, Titian of Cadore, 
have from childhood upwards studied the art of painting, desirous of a little fame rather than of profit. And although in the past, and also in the present, I have been urgently invited by His Holiness the Pope and other lords to enter their service, I, as the faithful subject of Your Excellencies, have rather cherished the wish to leave behind me a memorial in this famous city. Therefore, if it seem good to Your Excellencies, I am anxious to paint in the hall of the Great Council, employing therein all my powers, and to begin with, a canvas of the battle on the side of the Piazzetta, which is so difficult that no one has yet had the courage to attempt it. I should be willing to accept for my labor any reward that may be thought proper, or even less. Therefore, being as aforesaid studious only of honor and to please your excellencies, I beg to ask for the first broker's patent for life that shall fall vacant in the Fondaco de Tedeschi, irrespective of all promised reversions of such patent, and on the same conditions and with the same charges and exemptions as Messrs. Juan Bellin, or John Bellini, besides two assistants to be paid by the salt office, as well as all colors and necessaries, in return for which I promise to do the work above named with such speed and excellence as will satisfy the signori. A broker's patent, or a censoria, was formerly an appointment as trade intermediary between Venetian and foreign merchants. Actually, in the case of the broker's patent with the German merchants in Venice, it made the holder the official painter of the state and paid him 300 crowns, or $3,750 a year, for painting a portrait of the doja and such other pictures as the government might require. Apparently Titian's proposal was tentatively accepted by the council. In any case, he began to paint the Battle of Cadore in the Ducal Palace. But his rivals persuaded the council to withhold the patent from him and to suspend the pay of his assistants, this in 1514. After negotiations that irritated all concerned, he received the post and pay of the patent without the title, this in 1516. He, in his turn, procrastinated and did not complete till 1537 the two canvases that he had begun in the Sala del Maggior Concilio. They were destroyed by fire in 1577. Titian developed leisurely, like any organism dowered with a century of life, but as early as 1508, he showed the spiritual penetration and technical power that were to put him above all his rivals in portraiture. A nameless portrait, once named Ariosto, has in it a memory of Giorgione's style, a poetic face and subtle eyes a little malicious, and sumptuous raiment that set a model for a thousand later works. And in this period, from 1506 to 1516, the maturing artist already knew how to paint women of ample loveliness, stemming from Giorgione and expanding toward Rubens. The movement from the Virgin to Venus continued in Titian, even while he painted religious pictures of great splendor and renown. The same hand that stirred piety with a gypsy Madonna and an adoration of the shepherds could turn to a woman at her toilet, and that incarnation of voluptuous innocence, the flora of the Uffizi Gallery. This gentle face and generous bosom probably served again in the daughter of Herodias. Salome is as thoroughly Venetian as the severed head is powerfully Hebraic. In or near the year 1515, Titian produced two of his most celebrated pictures. The Three Ages of Man shows a group of naked infants sleeping beneath a tree, a Cupid so soon inoculating them with the mad pursuit, a bearded octogenarian contemplating a skull, and a young couple happy in the spring of love, yet looking at each other wistfully as if foreseeing the erosive pertinacity of time. Sacred and Profane Love has a modern title that would surprise a resurrected Titian. When first mentioned, in 1615, the picture was called Beauty Adorned and Unadorned. Probably it aimed not to point a moral, but to adorn a tale. The profane, nude, is the most perfect figure in Titian's repertoire, the very Venus de Milo of the Renaissance. But the sacred lady is secular too. Her jeweled girdle draws the eye, her silken gown tempts the touch. Probably she is the same buxom courtesan who posed for Flora and the woman at her toilet. If the spectator looks long enough, he will see a complex landscape behind the figures, plants and flowers and a thick clump of trees, a shepherd tending his flock, two lovers, hunters and dogs chasing a hare, a town and its towers, a church and its campanile, a green Georgianesque sea, a clouded sky. What difference does it make that we cannot know just what the picture means? It is beauty made to stay a while, and is that not what Faust thought worth a soul? Having learned that female beauty, adorned or natural, would always find customers, Titian pursued the theme joyously. 
Early in 1516, he accepted the invitation of Alfonso I to paint some panels in the Castello at Ferrara. The artist was lodged there with two assistants for some five weeks, and presumably came frequently thereafter from Venice. For the Alabaster Hall, Titian painted three pictures that continued Giorgione's pagan mood. In the Bacchanal, men and women, some of them naked, drink, dance, and make love before a landscape of brown trees, blue lake, and silver clouds. A scroll on the ground bears a French motto, He who drinks and does not drink again does not know what drinking is. In the distance, an old Noah sprawls naked and drunk. Closer a lad and lass join in dance, their garments whirling in the breeze. In the foreground, a woman whose firm breasts display her youth lies nude and sleeping on the grass. And near her, an anxious child raises his dress to ease his bladder and bring the Bacchic cycle to completion. In Bacchus and Ariadne, the abandoned woman is startled by a Bacchic procession bursting through the woods, drunken satyrs, a naked male entwined with snakes, the new god of wine leaping from his chariot to capture the fleeing princess. In these pictures, and the worship of Venus, the pagan renaissance is in full command. Meanwhile, Titian painted an arresting portrait of his new patron, the Duke Alfonso. A handsome, intelligent face, a corpulent body dignified with robes of state, a beautiful hand, hardly that of a potter and gunner, resting on a beloved cannon. This is the picture that stirred even Michelangelo to praise. Ariosto sat for a portrait and returned the compliment with a line in a later edition of the Furioso. Lucrezia Borgia, too, sat for the great portraitist, but no trace of that painting remains. And Laura Dianti, Alfonso's mistress, may have posed for a picture that survives only in a copy in Modena. It was probably for Alfonso that Titian made one of his finest pictures, the tribute money. A Pharisee with the head of a philosopher, asking his question sincerely, and a Christ answering without resentment, brilliantly. It is characteristic of the times that Titian could pass from Bacchus to Christ, from Venus to Mary and back again, with no apparent loss to his peace of mind. In 1518 he painted for the Church of the Frari his greatest work, The Assumption of the Virgin. When it was placed behind the high altar, in a majestic marble frame, the Venetian diarist Sanudo thought the event worth noting. May 20th, 1518. Yesterday the panel painted by Titian for the Minorites was put up. To this day the sight of the Frari Assumption is an event in any sensitive life. Near the center of the immense panel is the figure of the Virgin, full and strong, clothed in a robe of red and a mantle of blue, wrapped in wonder and expectation, lifted up through the clouds by an inverted halo of winged cherubim. Above her is an inevitably futile attempt to portray the deity, all raiment and beard, and hair disheveled by the winds of heaven. Finer is the angel that brings him a crown for Mary. Below are the apostles, a variety of magnificent figures, some gazing in astonishment, some kneeling in adoration, some reaching up as if to be taken with her into paradise. Standing before this powerful evocation, the unwilling skeptic mourns his doubts and acknowledges the beauty and aspiration of the myth. In 1519, Jacopo Pizarro, bishop of Paphos in Cyprus, in gratitude for the victory of his Venetian fleet over a Turkish squadron, commissioned Titian to paint another altarpiece for the Frari, for the chapel that had been dedicated there by his family. Titian knew the risk he was running in challenging comparison between his Madonna of the Pizarro family and his masterpiece so lately acclaimed. He worked for seven years on the new picture before he released it from his studio. He chose to represent the Virgin enthroned. But, defying precedent, he placed her at the right in a diagonal scheme that put the donor at the left, with St. Peter between them and St. Francis at her feet. The composition would have been thrown off balance but for the bright illumination focusing the mother and her child. Many an artist, tired of the traditional centralized or pyramidal structure of such pictures, welcomed and imitated the experiment. About 1523, Marquis Federigo Gonzaga invited Titian to Mantua. The artist did not stay long, for he had commitments in Venice and Ferrara, but he began a series of eleven paintings representing Roman emperors, these have been lost. On one of his visits he painted an attractive portrait of the young bearded Marquis. Federigo's mother, the splendid Isabella, was still living and sat for a picture. Finding the result uncomfortably realistic, she put it among her antiquities and asked Titian to copy a portrait that Francia had made of her forty years before. 
It was from this that Titian produced, circa 1534, the famous picture with the turban hat, the ornate sleeves, the stole of fur, the pretty face. Isabella protested that she had never been so beautiful, but she arranged to have this reminiscent portrait descend to posterity. Here for a while we leave Tiziano Vecelli. To understand his later career, we must fill in the background of political events in which his greatest patron, after 1533, Charles V, was intimately concerned. Titian was fifty-six in 1533. Who would have supposed that he still had forty-three years to live? and that he would paint as many masterpieces in his second half-century as in his first. 6. Minor Artists and Arts We must retrace our steps now and briefly honor two painters who were born after Titian but died long before his death. We bow in passing to Girolimo Savoldo, who came to Venice from Brescia and Florence and painted pictures of high excellence, the Madonna and Saints, now in the Brera Gallery, an ecstatic St. Matthew in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and a Magdalen in Berlin, far more tempting than the stout lady of that name in Titian. Giacomo Nigretti was named Palma from some hills near his birthplace, Serena, in the Bergamesque Alps. He became Palma Vecchio when his grandnephew Palma Giovanni also acquired fame. For a time he was considered the equal of Titian by their contemporaries. Perhaps some jealousy arose between them, which was not eased by Titian's stealing of Giacomo's mistress. Giacomo had painted her as Violante. Titian had her pose for his flora. Like Titian, Palma handled sacred and profane themes with equal skill, if not with equal zest. He specialized in sacred conversations or holy families, but probably owed his fame to his portraits of Venetian blondes, full-bosomed women who dyed their hair to an auburn hue. Nevertheless, his finest pictures are religious. A Santa Barbara in the church of Santa Maria Formosa, the patron saint of the Venetian bombardiers, and the Jacob and Rachel of the Dresden Gallery, a handsome shepherd sharing a kiss with a buxom lass. Palma's portraits would have ranked with the best of his time and city had not Titian produced half a hundred deeper ones. His pupil, Bonifacio de Pitati, called Veronese from his birthplace, adopted the style of Giorgione's Fête Champetre and Titian's Diana to adorn Venetian walls and furniture with attractive landscapes and nudes, and his Diana and Acteon is worthy of these masters. Lorenzo Lotto, less popular than Bonifacio in their day, has gained repute with the years. A shy, pious, melancholy spirit, he was not quite at home in Venice, where paganism resumed its sway as soon as the church bells and choirs ceased to sing. At the age of twenty in 1500, he produced one of the most original paintings of the Renaissance, the St. Jerome in the Louvre. No hackneyed image of the emaciated Eremite, but an almost Chinese study of somber chasms and mountainous rocks, amid which the old scholar is a minor element, at first hardly seen. This is the first European painting that reproduces nature in its wild dominance, rather than as an imaginary background. Passing to Treviso, Lorenzo painted for the Church of Santa Cristina a monumental altar back of the Madonna enthroned, which made his fame throughout northern Italy. Another success with the Madonna for the Church of San Domenico at Recanati earned him a call to Rome. There Julius II commissioned him to paint some rooms in the Vatican but when Raphael came, the frescoes that Lotto had begun were destroyed. Perhaps this humiliation helped to darken Lorenzo's mood. Bergamo better appreciated his peculiar talent for moderating the warm colors of Venetian art into softer tones more congruous with piety. Twelve years he labored there, modestly paid, but content to be first in Bergamo rather than fourth in Venice. For the church of San Bartolomeo, he painted an overcrowded but rather beautiful altarpiece, the Madonna in Majesty. Lovelier is an adoration of the shepherds at Brescia. The color, while full and pervasive, has a subdued tone more restful to eye and spirit than the brilliant effects of the great Venetians. A sensitive soul like Lotto's could at times penetrate more deeply into a personality than Titian. Few artists have caught the glow of healthy youth so intimately as in Lotto's portrait of a boy in the Castello at Milan. His self-portrait shows Lorenzo himself apparently well and strong, 
but he must have known much sickness and pain to represent illness so sympathetically as in The Sick Man of the Borghese Gallery, or in another of the same title in the Galleria Doria at Rome. An emaciated hand pressed over the heart, a look of pain and bewilderment on the face, as if asking why should he, so good or so great, be chosen by the germ. A more famous portrait, Laura di Pola, shows a woman of quiet beauty, also puzzled by life, and finding no answer except in religious faith. Lotto, too, came to that consolation. Restless, solitary, unmarried, he wandered from place to place, perhaps from philosophy to philosophy, until in his final years, from 1552 to 1556, he settled down as a resident in the convent of the Santa Casa at Loreto, near the holy house that pilgrims believed to have once sheltered the Mother of God. In 1554 he gave all his property to the convent and took an oblate's vows. Titian called him as good as goodness and as virtuous as virtue. Lotto had outlived the pagan renaissance and had sunk to rest, so to speak, in the arms of the Council of Trent. In that vibrant century, from 1450 to 1550, during which Venetian commerce suffered so many defeats and Venetian painting scored so many victories, the minor arts shared in the cultural exuberance. It was not for them a renaissance, for they were old and mature in Italy by Petrarch's time and merely continued their medieval excellence. Perhaps the mosaicists had lost some of their skill or patience. Even so, their work on St. Mark's was at least abreast of their age. The potters were now learning to make fine porcelain. Marco Polo had brought some from China. A sultan had sent fine specimens of it to the Doja in 1461. By 1470, the Venetians were making their own. The glassblowers at Murano reached in this period the acme of their art, making cristallo of exquisite purity and design. The names of the leading glass blowers were known throughout Europe, and every royal house competed for their wares. Most of them used a mold or model. Some put the mold aside, blew a bubble into the molten glass as it poured from the furnace, and shaped the substance into cups, vases, chalices, ornaments of a hundred colors and a thousand forms. Sometimes, learning from the Moslems, they painted the surface with colored enamel or gold. The glass artisans kept jealously in their families the secret processes by which they achieved their miracles of fragile beauty, and the Venetian government passed stern laws to prevent these esoteric subtleties from becoming known in other lands. In 1454, the Council of Ten decreed that if a workman carry into another country any art or craft to the detriment of the Republic, he will be ordered to return. If he disobeys, his nearest relatives will be imprisoned in order that the solidarity of the family may persuade him to return. If he persists in his disobedience, secret measures will be taken to have him killed, wherever he may be. The only known case of such an assassination was at Vienna in the 18th century. Despite the law, Venetian artists and artisans found their way over the Alps in the 16th century and brought their technique to France and Germany as gifts to the conquerors of Italy. Half the artisans of Venice were artists. Pewterers embellished dishes, platters, beakers, and cups with graceful borders and floral designs. The armorers were famous for damascened cuirasses, helmets, shields, swords, and daggers, and sheaths chased or engraved with elegant patterns. And other masters might make for short weapons ivory handles studded with gems. In Venice, about 1410, Baldassare degli Ambriachi, a Florentine, carved in bone the great altarpiece in thirty-nine sections, now in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. The woodcarvers not only made fine sculptural figures and reliefs, like the circumcision in the Louvre, or the chest painted by Bartolomeo Montagna, and formerly in the bombed Poldi Pezzoli Museum in Milan. They decorated the ceilings and doors and furniture of Venetian aristocrats with carvings, bosses, and intarsia, and chiseled the choir stalls of such churches as the Frari and San Zaccaria. Venetian jewelers met a heavy foreign as well as domestic demand, but took time to rise from quantity to quality. The goldsmiths, now under German instead of Oriental influence, turned out tons of plate, personal adornment, and decorative fixtures for everything from cathedrals to shoes. The illumination and calligraphy of manuscripts continued, slowly yielding to print. French and Flemish influences entered into the designs of Venetian textiles, but Venetian dyes and skills gave the products their favored texture and hues. 
It was from Venice that the Queen of France ordered three hundred pieces of dyed satin in 1532. And it was in the soft and luxurious stuffs worked in Venetian shops and in the colors given them in Venetian bats that the great painters of Venice found models for the lordly and glowing robes that made half the brilliance of their art. Venice almost realized Ruskin's ideal of an economy in which every industry would be an art and every product would proudly express the personality and artistry of the artisan. Venetian Letters 1. Aldous Minutius Venice was in this period too busy living to care much for books, and still its scholars, libraries, poets, and printers shared in giving it a fair name. It took no prominent part in the humanist movement. Nevertheless, humanism had here one of its noblest exemplars, Ermolao Barbaro, who was crowned poet by an emperor at fourteen, taught Greek, translated Aristotle, served his fellow men as a physician, his country as a diplomat, and his church as a cardinal, and was killed by the plague at thirty-nine. Venetian women made as yet little pretense to education. They were content to be physically alluring or maternally fertile or finally venerable. But in 1530, Irene of Spilimbergo opened a salon for men of letters, studied painting under Titian, sang sweetly, played well on viol, harpsichord, and lute, and talked learnedly about ancient and modern literature. Venice gave protection to intellectual refugees from the Turks in the east and from the Christians in the west. Here, Aretino would laugh securely at popes and kings, as centuries later Byron would here celebrate their decay. Aristocrats and prelates formed clubs or academies for the cultivation of music and letters, and opened their homes and libraries to the assiduous, the melodious, and the erudite. Monasteries, churches, and private families collected books. Cardinal Domenico Grimani had 8,000, which he gave to Venice. Cardinal Bessarion did the same with his precious hoard of manuscripts. To house these and the remnants of Petrarch's bequest, the government twice ordered the erection of a public library. War and other distractions foiled the plan. At last, in 1536, the Senate engaged Jacopo Sansovino to build the Libreria Vecchia, architecturally the most handsome library in Europe. Meanwhile, Venetian printers were producing the finest printed books of the age, perhaps of all time. They were not the first in Italy. Sveinheim and Panartz, once aides to Johann Fust in Mainz, set up the first Italian press in a Benedictine monastery at Subiaco in the Apennines in 1464. In 1467, they transferred their equipment to Rome and published 23 books in the next three years. In 1469 or earlier, printing began in Venice and Milan. In 1471, Bernardo Cignini opened a printing establishment in Florence, to the dismay of Politian, who mourned that now the most stupid ideas can in a moment be transferred into a thousand volumes and spread abroad. Copyists, thrown out of work, vainly denounced the new gadget. By the end of the 15th century, 4,987 books had been printed in Italy. 300 in Florence, 629 in Milan, 925 in Rome, 2,835 in Venice. The superiority of Venice in this regard was due to Teobaldo Manucci, who changed his name to Aldo Manuzio and later Latinized it into Aldus Minucius. Born at Bassiano in the Romagna in 1450, he learned Latin at Rome and Greek at Ferrara, both under Guarino da Verona and then himself lectured at Ferrara on the classics. Pico della Mirandola, one of his pupils, invited him to come to Carpi and tutor his two nephews, Leonello and Alberto Pio. Teacher and pupils developed a lasting mutual affection. Aldus added the name Pio to his own, and Alberto and his mother, Countess of Carpi, agreed to finance the first large-scale adventure in publishing. Aldus's plan was to collect, edit, print, and broadcast at nominal cost all the significant Greek literature that had been salvaged from the storms of time. It was a heady enterprise for a dozen reasons. Manuscripts were hard to get. Different manuscripts of the same classic varied dishearteningly in their text. Nearly all manuscripts were heavy with errors of transcription. Editors would have to be found and paid to collate and revise texts. Fonts of Latin and Greek type would have to be designed and cast. 
Paper would have to be imported in large quantities. Typesetters and pressmen would have to be engaged and trained. A machinery of distribution would need to be improvised. A book-buying public would have to be coaxed into existence on a wider base than ever before. And all this would have to be financed without the protection of copyright laws. Aldous chose Venice for his headquarters because its commercial connections made it an excellent center for distribution. Because it was the richest city in Italy, and had many magnates who might want to adorn their rooms with uncut books, and because it harbored scores of refugee Greek scholars who would be glad to be employed as editors or proofreaders. John of Speyer had already established the first printing press in Venice around 1469. Nicholas Jensen of France, who had learned the new art in Gutenberg's Mainz, set up another a year later. In 1479, Jensen sold his press to Andrea Torresano. In 1490, Aldous Minucius settled in Venice, and in 1499, he married Torresano's daughter. In his home near the church of Sant'Agostino, Aldous gathered Greek scholars, fed them, bedded them, and set them to editing classic texts. He talked Greek with them and wrote in Greek his dedications and prefaces. In his house, the new type was molded and cast, the ink was made, the books were printed and bound. His first publication in 1495 was a Greek and Latin grammar by Constantine Lascaris, and in that same year he began to issue the works of Aristotle in the original. In 1496 he published the Greek grammar of Theodorus Gaza, and in 1497 a Greek-Latin dictionary compiled by himself. For he continued to be a scholar even amid the hazards and tribulations of publishing. So in 1502, after years of study, he printed his own Rudimenta Grammaticae Linguae Latinae, with an introduction to Hebrew for good measure. From these technical beginnings, he went on to publish one after another of the Greek classics, from 1495 onward. Musaeus, Hero and Leander, Hesiod, Theocritus, Theognus, Aristophanes, Herodotus, Thucydides, Sophocles, Euripides, Demosthenes, Eschines, Lysias, Plato, Pindar, Plutarch's Moralia. In those same years he put forth a large number of Latin and Italian works, from Quintilian to Bembo, and the Adagia of Erasmus, who, sensing the vital import of all those enterprise, came in person to live with him for a time and edit not only his own Adagia, or Dictionary of Quotations, but Terence, Plautus, and Seneca, too. For the Latin books, Aldous had a graceful semiscript type designed, not, as legend said, from the handwriting of Petrarch, but by Francesco da Bologna, an expert calligrapher. This is the type that we now, from that origin, call italic. For the Greek texts, he cut a font based on the careful handwriting of his chief Greek scholar, Marcus Musurus of Crete. He marked all his publications with a motto, Festina Lente, Make Haste Slowly, and accompanied it with a dolphin symbolizing speed and an anchor standing for stability. This symbol, along with the pictured tower that Torrezano had used, established the custom of the printer's or publisher's colophon. All this worked at his enterprise quite literally night and day. This book is continued on cassette 11, side 1.